Today we'll be talking about Chapter 8, Communication. This is the process of exchanging information and communicating or generating that information between two or more people. The components in the communication process include a stimulus, a source, the message, the channel of communication, a receiver, and the feedback. Messages can be sent and received through verbal and nonverbal communication. Verbal communication depends on language while nonverbal communication involves body language. The challenges of using social media to communicate include protecting patient privacy and confidentiality and preventing unintended consequences for the nurse and the employer. The four levels of communication include interpersonal communication, interpersonal communication, small group communication, and focused and organized communication. Factors that influence communication include level of development, biological sex, sociocultural differences, roles and responsibilities, space and territoriality, physical, mental, and emotional state and environment. Assessment related to communication involves gathering information in both verbal and nonverbal forms. The SBAR technique, situation, background, assessment, and recommendations is one format for handoff communication used in healthcare today. And helping relationship exists among people who provide and receive assistance in meeting human needs. A helping relationship has three phases. You should know these phases. The orientation phase, the working phase, and the termination phase. When developing professional therapeutic communication skills, nurses should develop conversation and listening skills, use touch and humor and silence appropriately, and improve interviewing techniques. Failure to verbalize clearly and compassionately blocks effective communication. Disruptive behavior has a negative effect on clinical outcomes, patient safety, and interpersonal communication. Incivility, incivility and bullying, horizontal violence, and lateral violence are all forms of disruptive behavior and communication. So again, communication is simply the exchanging of information, generating and transmitting meanings between two or more people. Without communication, it would be impossible to share family experiences, gain knowledge, establish and maintain practice protocols, and enhance caregiving. Humans are social beings. We need each other. And these human relationships allow us to meet our physical and safety needs. Communication also helps meet psychosocial needs of love, belonging, and self-esteem. The ability to communicate is part of that basic human functioning and well-being. David Burlow listed five parts of the communication process, and he is credited with the classic description. This involves an encoder, also known as a source, a message, a channel, a receiver, also known as a decoder. Now, communication is initiated based on a stimulus or a reference or a referent. So this means that uh, a patient has a problem that needs to be addressed and you as the nurse are going to address it. The patient might have discomfort, they might be seeking information or may need to address some um, information about an upcoming procedure or a new diagnosis that they're not sure of. The sender or the so source, the encoder of the message, in this case the patient, is the person that initiates or begins the communication process or stimulates that communication process. The message is the actual communication product that comes from the source. That could be the patient's speech to you. Um, it could be a verbal cue. It could be some sort of guarding or um, grimacing that you see visually or the patient could grab your hand, touch you. Uh, those are all ways that the patient would communicate that medic message to you. So the message itself is the actual product that comes from the source. And again, that could be speech, uh, chart, a nursing note, uh, the patient speaking to you. The channel of communication is the medium or the method that the sender has selected to send the message. This channel might target any of the receiver's senses. So the message could be sent to the receiver through the following channels. Auditory through spoken words and cues. Uh, visual through sight, observations, or perception. And kinesthetic through touch. 
nurses use all three channels to communicate with patients and other healthcare providers. To be an effective communicator, the nurse needs to be considerate of the receiver, select a message that appeals to the receiver or the patient, and one that requires minimal effort for the patient to decode or decipher. Meaning that when we talk or we discuss information with the patient, when we're teaching them or talking to them, we talk in a manner that's respectful, that is age and developmentally appropriate, and one that is in line with their desires and goals. So again, components in the process of communication include the sender. This is the person delivering the message to the recipient. The message, this refers to the message that the sender is relaying to the receiver. The channel of communication, that is that transmission or method of delivering, whether it be auditory, visual, or kinesthetic. And then decoding is the interpretation of the message. That is done by the receiver. The receiver is the person who receives the message. And then sometimes we use feedback. In some instances, the feedback uh, will come from the receiver or a response will be given to the sender and this starts an interaction. Feedback from the receiver is essential and this um, is both verbal and nonverbal evidence that the message was not only received but understood. So we start again with the source or the encoder, as you see um, on the left here in the purple box. The message is then sent across to the uh, receiver or the decoder. If you look in the middle there, you have the channel and that's the way that it's sent. So it's either a visual message, an auditory message, or a message through kinesthetic or touch. The recoder interprets the message and they provide some sort of feedback back to source. There are four levels of communication. The first one we're going to talk about is intrapersonal. This means within the person and this type of communication is really important for the nurse. Um, it helps her to build her confidence. So the nurse is doing a new skill or doing something that she hasn't done in a while and she's talking herself through it, you know, telling herself to calm down and letting herself know that uh, she can complete this task easily. Um, and so it's a positive interaction that we build within ourselves, and it carries over to the patient and the family. When you um, talk to yourself in a positive way before you do something, it allows you to calm down and face that uh, personal challenge. Interpersonal communication is communication that occurs between two or more people with a goal to exchange messages. And this is something that we do every day, all day as a nurse. We're always communicating with the patient, with the family members, with the physician, with other team members. And the point of that communication is to give them a message, either a status update or something important about the patient or something that's going on. When you communicate effectively at the interpersonal level, it allows you to share your experiences, obtain goals, team build, and it makes you become an effective team leader, such as a caregiver, a teacher, a counselor, um, a patient advocate. The next type of communication we're going to talk about is group communication. This can inv involve a small group or organizational group communication. Um, small group occurs when the nurse interacts with two or more people and they have a common goal that they're trying to achieve. Examples of small group communication include things like staff meetings or patient care conferences. Organizational communication occurs when people or groups within an organization communicate to achieve a common goal. An example would be nurses working on a policy and, and procedure committee um, working on interdisciplinary groups, uh, quality assurance teams, strategic planning, things that uh, aim towards achieving those organizational goals. So we have this organizational communication and the purpose of it is to achieve aims or achieve goals for the organization. When you're looking at the effectiveness or ineffectiveness of a group, we use something called group dynamics and that's how we study the group and how the group relates to one another during the process of working towards 
those group goals. Effective leadership can facilitate a group's achievement of its goals, but success or failure largely results from members' behavior and their communication or lack thereof. Effective groups have members that are mutually respectful. If a group member dominates the group process, then the leader or other group member will confront the member to promote the needed um, relationship with others or to you know, make sure that that leader understands that everybody's participation is important. There are several characteristics that can make the group effective or ineffective. Group identity is one of those um, characteristics, and this is when the members value and own the aims of the group. When they do this, then the aims are clearly articulated and the group moves in a common direction um, of what we want it to flow or what we want it to move in. Cohesiveness. When there is cohesiveness amongst the group, uh, the members will value uh, the group, they'll trust it, they'll like one another, they're loyal to the group, and we will get a high level of commitment and a high level of cooperation from that group. When they're not committed or they're not loyal, then we won't see that same uh, that same response. Uh, people will be less likely to trust or believe, or maybe they won't get along with each other. Uh, patterns of interaction. So when the patterns of interaction are honest and direct, the communication froze, flows freely. The members will support, praise, and critique one another. Uh, decision making. So when we're able to identify decisions that need to be made or problems that need to be resolved, uh, we use the appropriate method of decision making and the decision is implemented and followed through with a group commitment to the decision and those group commit commitments are usually high. Uh, as far as responsibility, members feel a strong sense of responsibility, and when the members feel that responsibility, you're gonna have better group outcomes. And then leadership. We have to have an effective style of leadership, one that meets not only the aims of the group, but correlates with the type of um, people that are in the group or the group members so you know for one sort of group we actually could use a laissez-faire type of lifestyle or uh, leadership style I'm sorry um, if you had very autonomous people or a lot of high power people then you might be able to use a laissez-faire because those people le need little direction or little guidance but um, at other levels you may need an autocratic leadership style so what works best for the group and then uh, powers of sources, sources of power are recognized and used appropriately. So we have these sources of power, power. We need to recognize who they are and use them accordingly to get the things that we need to get done. Um, also, those um, interests of those with little power also must be considered because some people don't have as much power as others. So they rely on others to um, get them to that level. So what kind of fa factors influence communication? Uh, one, developmental level. Developmental level is directly correlated with the patient's neurological competence and cognitive development. Knowing how each age group will perceive health and illness and bodily functions helps guide your interaction with the patient. For example, 10 year old who has a limited understanding of what an infection is and how it affects the body would have to explain things in simple terms so the child is able to cooperate with the treatment without being scared to death. Adolescents are more abstract type of thinkers and they require more detailed and accurate explanations. Communicating with adults can be based on the past positive or negative health experiences that they've had and whatever inaccurate information that they may have received along the way. And then communicating with the geriatric population or our older adults. With these patients, we have to be cognitive of um, any issues that they might have with hearing, sight, confusion, 
depression, uh, or anything else that might affect that patient-nurse relationship. And then gender. Men and women have different uh, communication styles. So we could both listen to the same conversation and the man might come out with the one interpretation of what he heard and the woman might come out with a completely different interpretation of what was heard. So we have to be uh, cognitive of that. Uh, and then um, sociocultural differences. What type of sociocultural differences do you need to be aware of? Um, would you recognize? Um, so culture, economic conditions, overall lifestyles, all these can influence the patient's preferred mode of communication. Understanding the patient's culture will help you understand nonverbal communication and deliver more accurate care uh, to your patient or their family. The first step towards cultural competence includes becoming aware of your own personal cultural beliefs and identifying those prejudices or those attitudes that could be a barrier or affect um, your ability to communicate with someone else from another culture. And then uh, patients with limited proficiency in English have difficulty understanding certain medical instructions and test results as well as diagnoses. So you want to try to remain aware of the cultural variations and be careful to use lay terminology when you're speaking with these patients. Uh, use of medical terminology such as a myocardial infarction or cerebrovascular accident or cholecystectomy can alienate a patient and inhibit further communication. All patients need to be evaluated for language proficiency upon admission to a facility and interpreting, serv and interpreting services would be made available immediately to facilitate any communication and improve the quality of care. Regarding roles and responsibilities, the challenge in providing care is to respect the patient's roles and responsibilities because these influence the way that the patient communicates without denying the patient need for care. For example, an excess, a successful attorney might have a take charge attitude and seem extremely self-sufficient. However, a skilled nurse knows that she could still provide an opening for the patient to verbalize his or her needs. So you might say to the patient, hey, you seem well prepared for the procedure today and in control, but I know that sometimes patients have questions that don't get answered or fears that remain unvoiced. Is there anything I can help you with while I'm here? Be very careful not to ignore patients who don't complain or who never ask for anything. Because power differences in the healthcare professional, patient relationships sometimes make communication intimidating. And you'll often hear patients say to the nurse, oh, I didn't want to bother you, or you seem so busy, you had so much to do, um, so I didn't want to bother you. Space and territoriality, people are most comfortable in areas they consider their own. So healthcare professionals behave differently sometimes when they're on their own turf or in the hospital, as opposed to in the patient's home. It's important for the nurse to understand how territory influences the nurse-patient relationship. An understanding of personal space and distancing characters can enhance the quality of the communication. So when you're doing your interviews with patients, you should be anywhere from 18 inches to four feet. This might be an optimal distance to sit from someone during an interview. So, you know, it might be hard for you to calculate 18 inches. So maybe think two feet to four feet is a safe distance. For some people like European or African Americans, they may require more personal space um, than just that two to four feet. So take cues from your patients. Note whether they're moving back from you as you come in or you lean in or you get closer. Many nursing interventions take place in close proximity to a patient and cause a forced sort of intimacy. But be sensitive about how offensive this is to certain patients, especially those patients who are accustomed to large areas of private space. Be sure to ask the patient's permission before touching them, especially um, in their private zones. 
most people consider hands, arms, shoulders, and back in a social zone, and then increasing levels of privacy um, are according to mouth and feet, number one, face, neck, and front of body, number two, and three, genitalia. Also, be a cognitive of the physical, mental, and emotional state, the degree to which people are physically comfortable and mentally emotional to um, engage in interactions that may influence communication. Things like a full bladder, a headache, crushing chest pain, anxiety can all negatively influence communication. Cognitively impaired patients present with special communication challenges. For example, an older adult who is agitated has aphasia and is suffering from abscessed tooth pain. She may be, or he may not be able to communicate properly with the nurse. Values is another aspect we have to take into consideration. Communication is influenced by the way people value themselves, one another, and the purpose of any human interaction. Nurses who believe that teaching is an important aspect of nursing and who value empowering patients will communicate this to the patients. And then environment. Communication happens best when the environment facilitates an easy exchange of needed information. So the environment should be calm, quiet, conducive to the communication and non-threatening. The goal is to minimize distractions and ensure privacy. Answer the following statement. Um, Touch is a personal behavior that means the same thing to all persons, true or false. And if you said false, you would be correct. Touch is a personal behavior that means different things to different people. So we ask people before we touch. Forms of communication include both verbal and nonverbal. With verbal communication, um, we're talking about the exchange of information using words. It's dependent upon language, and it's a means to express thoughts and feelings. A person's use of written and spoken language often reveals aspects about their intellectual level, educational level, geographic, and cultural origin. Nurses have to consider whether English is a second language for the patient. Language helps nurses assess what the patient knows and feels, and nurses must develop their own language skills in order to assist in reciprocal responses in the communication process. Nurses use verbal communication extensively when providing patient care, including uh, conversations with patients, family, providing oral reports to other nurses or healthcare providers, developing nursing care plans, or evaluating patient progress. Other examples could be public speaking, uh, collaborations for publication, or dissemination of health information. Nonverbal communication is the exchange of information without the use of words. It's also known as body language. And nonverbal communication helps nurses understand the subtle and hidden meanings in what the patient is saying verbally. For example, the nurse asks the patient, how do you feel today? And the patient states, okay, but grimaces or shows some sort of sign of pain or discomfort. The nurse notes that the patient does not maintain eye contact and his facial expression is tense. This should prompt the nurse to investigate further because the patient's verbal and non-communication non-verbal communication do not match each other. Body language can mirror or enhance what is verbally communicated, but if the verbal and non-verbal messages conflict, the nurse should believe the non-verbal message. Therefore, nurses must be aware of both nonverbal messages they send and nonverbal messages they receive from patients. Nurses work with patients from diverse cultural backgrounds and should attempt to understand the cultural variations to avoid misunderstanding nonverbal communication. Touch is a tactile form of nonverbal communication. It's personal and it means different things to different people. 
Eye contact often begins with a glance or an attention-getting method to open the conversation. In many cultures, eye contact suggest respect and a willing listen to listen however in um, other cultures its absence can mean avoidance of communication asian and native american cultures view eye contact as an invasion of privacy and some cultures are taught to avoid on eye contact with superiors or with people that are higher up on the chain than them Other messages can be sent by eye contact. For example, the eyes may be fixed in a stare during anger or narrowed in disgust or open wide in response to fear. Some people who experience fear might not be able to speak and only their eyes will send that message of anxiety. A blank stare can indicate daydreaming or inattentiveness or even a seizure. Facial expressions. The face is the most expressive part of the body, and examples of messages that the face expressions convey are anger, joy, suspicion, and so on. People have extremely expressive faces, whereas others mask their feelings or may have no affect, making it harder to determine what the person is thinking. Lurses must learn to control their, control their own facial express, expressions. Posture is another um, part of the body that carries nonverbal messages. People in good health tend to walk with their bodies in good alignment, and depressed or tired people often slouch. Posture also provides nonverbal clues about pain and physical limitations. For example, a rigid, stiff appearance might be a good indicator of tension and pain. Gait. Uh, normally, we have this purposeful walk that carries a message of well-being. A less purposeful shuffling gait can mean the person is sad, discouraged, or certain illnesses like Parkinson's can cause us to shuffle. Also, uh, when a patient is post-op or in a weaker state. Gestures use various parts of the body and carry numerous messages. For example, thumbs up can mean victory or kicking an object can express anger. You can also use hand signals to wave someone over or to shoo them away. Gestures are often used extensively when two people speaking in different languages attempt to communicate with each other. Many illnesses cause at least some variation in the general physical appearance. Observing for changes in appearance is important. For example, a person with an insufficient intake of fluid will have dry skin that wrinkles easily, eyes that are sunken and dull in appearance, and poor muscle tone. On the other hand, a person in good appearance tends to radiate a healthy status through their general appearance. A person's clothes and grooming practices carry significant nonverbal messages. For example, some people's clothing or grooming practices aren't very healthy looking. Uh, when people feel ill, they often demonstrate little interest in their personal appearance. Other um, examples of nonverbal forms of communication are crying, moaning, gasping, or sighing. So a cry might mean sadness or joy. Gasping might indicate fear or surprise. Periods of silence during a conversation often carry important nonverbal messages. Like a silence between two people can mean that both of them are thinking or that they are angry with each other. Other um, things that we have to think about are the special communication needs with a certain population or those with special needs. So with those patients, we want to think about visual impairments, hearing impairment, any physical barriers that might be in the way, um, any um, impairment in their cognitive level, um, if they're unconscious. So like when we go in to take care of our patients that are comatose, we want to make sure that we're talking and connecting with those patients. Even though they might be on a ventilator, we're not just going in there to deal with the machines. We should touch the person and talk to the person. Uh, a lot of the times people can hear. They always say that hearing is the last thing to go. And then we have to consider our non-English speaking population as well. For um, electronic communication, um, for social media, we do use a lot of um, internet now for everything. So you have to be really careful with the uh, internet 
and with social media. The American Nurses Association and the Council of Boards of Nursing have issued guidelines for RNs regarding the use of social media. Uh, email and text messages you have to also be careful with because you can easily violate patient privacy or confidentiality. Um, anytime you send a message, either th through email or uh, through a text message. Most agencies have a security measure uh, in place to safeguard email and text message communications. SBAR, this is a um, terminology that um, started being used like back in the 60s by the Navy and um, this is a form of communication, a handoff form of communication is what we call it and um, it involves the process of accurate presentation of and acceptance of patient related information from one uh, healthcare provider to another. It could be nurse to doctor, nurse to nurse, um, nurse to other healthcare providers. And this helps to try to eliminate breakdowns in communication and adverse events. So the Joint Commission actually endorsed this in a goal that they had to improve effectiveness of communication among caregivers as a national patient safety goal. Um, both the Joint Commission and the Institute for Healthcare have recommended SBAR to improve handoff communication. And again, SBAR stands for Situation, Background, Assessment, and Recommendations. Now, QSEN, Quality of Safety and Education for Nurses, um, added two more components to that with um, the thought of the nursing student in mind and it's just a safer measure for nurses and all so one of those things um, that it added was I in the beginning so I S bar and then the S bar will have two R's on it so the I stands for introduction of yourself and the patient and the R is for the provider to read back and verify that all the information discussed was so that the situation did until uh, what happened and just to review and give another thought to make sure that the orders that they given are um, full and that they will meet the needs of the patient. So um, this SBAR or ISBAR uh, provides a standardized sort of framework to help uh, reduce perceived anxiety and increase confidence uh, related to handoff report in nursing students. So that's why it was introduced. And then the Joint Commission also came up with another tool called TST, Targeted Solutions Tool, with, which examines the handoff communication problems and identifies causes for failures and barriers in an effort to improve communication among nurses and other healthcare providers. The helping relationship is um, something that we develop with the patient. Relationships between healthcare providers and patients do not um, develop but occur uh, through purposeful communication, so it's not a spontaneous thing. It's characterized by unequal sharing of information. It's built on the patient's needs. The nurse becomes the helper and the patient is the person being helped. Communica communication is the means used to establish rapport and helping uh, and making that trusting relationship. So the helping relationship exists among people who provide and receive assistance in meeting human needs and it helps set the client for the participants to move forward through common goals. Uh, the patient's needs are met as a result of a successful and helping relationship. When a nurse and patient are involved in a helping relationship, also described as the nurse-patient relationship, the nurse will be the helper and the patient will be the person being helped. The quality of the relationship between those two people is the most significant element in determine, determining how uh, effective it is. Of all the problems that can arise in nursing care, the most common is failure to establish rapport and a helping, trusting relationship with the other person. Communication is the means that's used to establish that rapport and that helping trust relationship. However, you must remember that these are professional relationships and we have to identify nurse models who through their appearance, demeanor, and behavior communicate a clear sense of professionalism or confidence and expertise in their practice. 
patients and the public are more likely to trust and value a nurse who appears competent and confident and one who's focused on the patient that is entrusted to their care. When nurses are rude, sloppy, or inattentive to the person or engage in sexually inappropriate behavior or other breaches of professionalism, it undermines the nursing professionalism image and the effectiveness of the individual nurse. The helping relationship is tangible. It has at least the following three basic characteristics. It's dynamic. The person providing the assistance and the person being helped are active participants. It's purposeful and time limited, meaning that um, there are specific goals that are intended to be met within a certain period and the person providing the assistance is professionally accountable for the outcomes of the relationship and the means used to obtain those goals. The goals of the helping relationship are defined in terms of patient needs. Selected nursing interventions will help the person move towards those goals as the patient needs and goals change, so will nursing care interventions implemented to obtain those goals. The focus is on patient needs. So the helping relationship or the nurse patient relationship is described ordinarily as having three phases, the orientation phase, the working phase, and the termination phase. So again, that's the orientation phase, the working phase, and the termination phase. Now, during the orientation phase, the nurse learns to call the nurse by name. The patient will accurately describe the roles of participants in the relationship. The patient and the nurse will establish an agreement or a contract about the goals of the relationship, the location, the frequency, and the length of the contacts, also the duration of the relationship. During the working phase, the patient will actively participate in the relationship. The patient will cooperate in activities that work towards achieving mutually acceptable goals. The patient will express feelings and concerns to the nurse. And then during the termination phase, uh, the patient will participate in identifying goals accomplished or progress made towards those goals patient verbalizes feelings about the termination of the relationship. Despite, despite the fact that patient stays are now shorter than in the past, um, we have an increased reliance on technology. Skilled professional communication with the patient and their family is essential and remains a vital part of a helping relationship. Nurses that are competent, honest, and skilled communicators are viewed as effective, compassionate caregivers. Helping relationships is a critical component of what nurses do and plays a vital role in promoting health, enhancing safety, and improving clinical outcomes. A dispositional trait is a characteristic or a customary way of behaving. Nurses who consistently demonstrate warmth and friendliness, openness, rapport, empathy, honesty, and authenticity, and trust, and caring, and competence are well disposed to communicate effectively. So dispositional traits would include warmth and friendliness, openness and respect, empathy, honesty, authenticity, trust, caring, and competence. And rapport builders would include specific objectives, comfort comfortable environments, privacy, confidentiality, focus on the patient versus the task, uh, utilization of nursing observations, and optimal pacing, meaning going at the patient's speed. Uh, to develop conversation skills, nurses have to control the tone of their voice, uh, control facial expressions, be knowledgeable about the topic of the conversation, be flexible, clear, and concise. Try to avoid words that might have different interpretations, be truthful with the patient, keep an open mind, and take advantage of available teaching and other opportunities. Listening is a skill that involves both uh, hearing and interpreting what other people say. So uh, it requires attention and con concentration to sort out, evaluate, and validate clues to better understand the true meaning of what is being said. 
uh, a few skills here that you can take advantage of um, to be a better listener is to sit when you communicate so you're not standing over them be alert and al and relaxed take your time pace the uh, interview don't try to rush through it keep the conversation as natural as possible maintain eye contact if appropriate and if you are able Use appropriate facial expressions and body gestures and think before responding to the patient. Do not pretend to listen. Listen for themes in the patient's comments. Use silence, therapeutic touch, and humor appropriately. The purpose of the patient interview is to obtain accurate, thorough information. In nursing, the interview is a major tool for collecting data and part of the assessment step of the nursing process. All interviews should begin with an explanation of the purpose of the interview. During the interview, use techniques to obtain needed information while remaining flexible in your approach. The interview itself is a therapeutic interaction and might be an essential part of the orientation phase of the helping relationship. So be sure to use open-ended questions or comments, closed questions or comments, validating questions, clarifying questions, Reflective statements where you repeat back what the patient said, sequencing where you put things in chronological order, and direct questions. Characteristics of the assertive nurse's self-presentation include uh, having a confident open body posture, using eye contact, of clear, concise I statements and the ability to share effectively the nurse's thoughts, feelings, and emotions. The assertive nurse's attitude towards work is characterized by working to capacity with or without supervision, the ability to remain calm under supervision, and the freedom to ask for help when necessary. Also, the ability to give and accept compliments and honestly in admitting mistakes and taking responsibilities for them. When interacting with patients, family members, other nurses, healthcare providers of the other healthcare team, nurses should communicate in a way that demonstrates respect for all parties. Assertive behavior is the ability to stand up for yourself and others using open, honest, and direct communication. The focus is on the issue, not the person. Aggressive behavior, on the other hand, involves asserting one's rights in a negative manner that violates the rights of others. It can be verbal or physical. It's communication that's marked by tension and anger and inhibits the formation of good relationships and collaboration. Characteristics of aggressive verbal behavior include using an angry tone of voice, making accusations, demonstrating belligerence and intolerance. Aggressive behavior is rude and threatening, and the focus is usually on winning at all costs or demonstrating personal excellence. Empathy is an objective understanding of the way in which a patient Empathy limits the nurse's ability to focus subjectively on the patient's needs. An empathetic nurse is sympathetic or sensitive to the patient's feelings and problems, but remains objective enough to help the patient work to obtain positive outcomes. You can establish successful helping relationships without appearing cold and stern by retaining the quality of empathy. Nurses who have a good understanding of their own feelings and responses are better able to communicate and respond to others. Those who fail to verbalize clearly and compassionately will block effective communication. So some blocks to consider are failure to perceive the patient as a human. We saw this a few years back um, and may still see it in places like Los Angeles where they take their patients from the emergency room and dump them into an alley because uh, they don't have a home or a place to discharge the patient to. Failure to listen, non-therapeutic comments and questions, using cliches, using closed questions or questions that contain the word why or how that put the patient on defense. Um, and there's some other ones here that you can look at. Um, incivility, uh, rude, disruptive, intimidating, and undesirable behavior directed at another person also includes failing to act when action is warranted, such as refusing to assist a coworker or share important information about a patient's care. 
This is considered by some as a precursor to bullying behavior or lateral violence and by others as a form of bullying. Bullying or negative uh, repetitive disruptive behavior also referred to as horizontal or lateral violence and professional incivility. In horizontal violence, anger and aggressive behavior between nurses or nurse, to nurse hostility occurs. With nurse bullying, nurses who refuse to be victims can break the cycle of violence. Once bullying and other disruptive behaviors and communications are recognized as problems, the need for a culture change is evident. Education is crucial. Nurses need to learn effective communication strategies to combat bullying. Assertiveness and aggressiveness training are also effective in addressing bullying. Uh, negative communication can also occur between the nurse and the physician. The organizational response to disruptive behaviors, addressing disruptive behaviors, requires determination that bullying and other behaviors and inappropriate communication will no longer be tolerated in order to promote a healthy work environment. Emphasis must be placed on the importance of documenting the bullying behaviors and the disruptive communication. 